right now we're going to be talking about the Dirac Lagrangian. Um, again, my apologies for my dog. He's being such a pain today. I don't know why, but I've had to stop this video literally five times and restart. And if you can hear him whining in the background, again, my apologies. Um, if you contribute to this channel, um, I will eventually get an office space where you don't hear him whining in the background, if you hear him whining in the background. It, he's just been so annoying today. Um, so we're going to start talking about the Dirac Lagrangian. So the Dirac Lagrangian is, um, it looks like this, right? So I'm just going to, I'm just going to cut to the chase here. I'm going to write down the Dirac Lagrangian. It looks a little something like this. Uh, minus M. Now, it's important to know that we're not using this symbol, right? So this symbol is for, uh, is going to be associated with scalar fields, right? So, and that's what we've been talking about with the Klein-Gordon Lagrangian. We're now using these symbols right here, right? So these symbols right here correspond to a spinner field. Um, and so the Dirac Lagrangian, uh, it will tell us something about the dynamics of spinners. There's a couple of other objects in here, or really just one other object in here that um, we need to look at. And that's this right here. Oh, wrong thing. And that's this guy right here. This, these are called Dirac matrices. And what they look like, I'll write them out. Um, the Dirac matrices, there's four of them. And they arise when we begin to consider the concept of spin um, in particles. And they look like this. They're four by four matrices. Uh, and um, right, so we have this pattern here where where we have uh, like that. So there's our, our gamma zero matrix, our gamma one matrix is going to look like um, this, where we have uh, negative one, negative one, one, and one along our diagonals, two, uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, two, one, two, like that. There's our gamma one. Our gamma two matrix is going to look like this. What's interesting about these matrices, again, I'll speak as I write these down, is that they obey um, a very interesting set of rules, which we'll get into, because, and what, which means that they, uh, these matrices will form something on a group. This is really where the idea of group theory begins to sort of emerge, because um, group theory is this whole area of, um, of, math, mathematics, that is involved in understanding numbers from a clearly, from a clearly different perspective than what we're used to. And, um, I can't speak as I write this down. So I'm just going to write this down. I can't, the, the reason I'm looking up here is because even I can't remember these off the top of my head sometimes. And so I, I just want to make sure I'm getting these right for you guys. Um, but these are, they obey unitarity. They're, 
and we'll go over that later when we review quantum mechanics. We'll review quantum mechanics, I believe, in chapter seven, seven or eight, one of the two. But these are our gamma matrices, and what do these tell us? These are very interesting because they, you, we could, for example, write down our Lagrangian, Dirac Lagrangian, say L Dirac is equal to, here's our phi, and here's our um, imaginary number, phi, and we could just select a, a, a number from you, say, um, one, right, so that means we have, that means mu has to be one here, like this. So this is a Dirac Lagrangian, and that's embedded in here. Um, that's embedded in this overall Lagrangian. So what we're looking at is actually four Lagrangians right here, right, because we have four of these. And they're all, what's interesting is that you can notice that some of these have these interesting diagonals where um, those, that, that means there's going to be mixing of different components. Uh, so if we were, so what I mean by that is that we have, um, get rid of, so if we had, say, three and three, right, so if we were to do that, we were ha we will have, and if our phi is some spinner, say, a left chiral spinner, we're going to get mixing of, um, of these components when we do this multiplication. What's important to note also is that these here are spatial derivatives, right? But these are not. This doesn't refer, these do not have spatial components to them. And spinners do not have spatial components to them I <coughs> either, excuse me. Anyways, these are very, very interesting objects. And it's important to know also that uh, these spinners, I also have this object here that I wrote in the Lagrangian. This is the complex conjugate of the spinner, right? So just like we can have complex numbers, we can have complex, or just like we can have complex scalars, right? Where we have that i in the exponent of e, where we're those are fundamentally complex because there's that i in there. Um, these uh, spinners can be complex conjugated. And a complex conjugate of a spinner is what we denote by this bar on top of the spinner. All right, so we have the spinner, and then we have its complex conjugate. My dog is being really annoying right now. Again, my apologies. Um, so what does this mean? Well, what does we can consider, for example, what a um, what the inner product is between a spinner and its own complex conjugate, and we're going to define the book. Really, just defines this as. Um, my dagger, right? So, oh my God, I don't know why my dog is whining so much. It's so annoying. Um, we sort of define the um, the inner product of these two like this, where this here. Oh well, I'll show you explicitly what this is. This is. Um, if we remember back from, I think, chapter three, we can write a Dirac spinner as a mix between two vial spinners, right? And we're, we're, this is taking the adjoint, I think is what that, what the symbol is called. And then we can do gamma zero and this is again, our Dirac spinner. Right, so when we take 
the adjoint were really just um, doing this and our I um, our gamma zero here is uh, this guy right here right where we have right here I'm gonna I'll, I can box box these like this this quadrant is really just a two by two um, a two by two identity matrix same thing here two by two identity matrix so we can write this as zero i two by two. This is really just to condense our notation a little bit, two by two, like this. And then we have our um, and this has to be uh, uh, complex conjugated as well. And then what we get is um, a mixing of the two, right? Because this is really just going to be, this is going to be x dagger. Um, and because the, because this here is in this position, we're going to get basically an inversion of our Dirac spinner, and this ends up becoming um, that, right? So this is telling us that is equal to This is going to be an important identity for later on. And this is something that the book sort of kind of gives us as sort of a definition, just to sort of help us um, with things that we'll do later on. It's also important to note um, that that this is what we're jumping a little bit into group theory now, where um, this excuse me, here, gamma mu, gamma nu, if this is something that you're interested in me proving, again, for the sake of um, brevity and for the sake of time, I'll go, I'll go ahead and do that in my Patreon page if that's something that you're interested in watching. Um, we have uh, this right here. This is a very interesting idea. This com this these curly brackets, uh, these d d denote something called the Clifford algebra, right? Where again, the book doesn't go that deep into this. It really doesn't, and so I'm not going to go that deep into it because of this book. Um, but I'll, I'll go a little bit into this, a little bit that the book doesn't go into, or it. it the, what this means, what this means fundamentally is that this is that's what this means. So this right here is that and we're saying that that is equal to 2 times the metric times four by four matrix or four by four identity matrix. All right, so you could say gamma one, gamma two plus gamma two, um, gamma one 
is equal to two uh, uh, I said one was mu and two times the identity matrix four by four. Well, that means that, well, if we remember our eta mu nu, this is negative one, 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 down the diagonals and zero everywhere else. So this is actually going to be zero times the identity matrix, the identity four by four. So this actually ends up being zero. And you can go ahead and test this out if you want. If you you can do the matrix multiplication yourself, and you can find out that this is this indeed does work. Um, so this is a very interesting, another very interesting property about the gamma matrices. So brief, very quickly, we have this right here. So we've defined what the inner product is in between a spinner and its complex conjugate. And we have shown that the gamma matrices obey this interesting Clifford algebra. Right, I'll say that this is Clifford of gamma matrices. Um, and we can also consider the, um, applying the, or the Lagrange equations. We can consider applying the Euler Lagrange equations to our Dirac, um, our Dirac Lagrangian, right? We can do that right now. So, uh, zero is equal to DL, uh, D, and I'm going to pick, uh, we can do this for phi, right, but I'm going to pick the con the complex conjugate instead, because doing it for phi is going to be a little bit more complex, and the book says that it's a little bit more complex, a little slightly more nuanced, uh, doing it for phi. It can be done, though. Um, but the book will go into uh, just doing it in terms of the complex conjugate. Um, D mu DL. I'm just writing down the Euler Lagrange equations again. And what I'll do here, I'm just going to select this and bring it down a little bit further just to denote that we're sort of working on something different. It's, it's kind of, it, one of the difficult things about, um, about the Euler Lagrange equations is that, or not about the Dirac equations, that there's so much to it. There's so much different independent things you can do with it that it's really hard to keep track. And what I think I'm gonna end up doing by the end of this is providing a summary sheet of what we've covered so far just so that we don't lose sight of the big picture here. All right, so what we're gonna do, or what I'm gonna do, is exactly what the book does, which is to um, cover uh, just the Euler-Lagrange equation for uh, the, the uh, adjoint spinner, right? So I've been calling it different names, this object here with the bar over it is sort of the adjoint or the um, the complex conjugate, if you will, of of this object. Um, these these are spinners, right? So when we do this, our um, our Euler-Lagrange equation um, gives us this. I gamma mu like that. So that comes from this, and then we're gonna get minus, well, the derivative of 
I'll just go back up to here. Right, so the derivative, so if I'm just gonna point out here, so we have this part and it's going to be multiplied again by this over here. So we're kind of doing the, the foil thing. And then we're gonna multiply by this, right? Well, all of this times this is just gonna be, ooh, yeah, that's gonna sort of be the constant out front. Here, I can write it out explicitly. Actually, I'll just copy paste it. How, how, how about that? The beauty of technology is that we can just copy paste nowadays. Copy that. And, I'll just paste it right here. So we want to keep this in mind. This is our, this here is our Lagrangian. Well, our first term is going to be all of this times this times this. Well, this and this is going to be the constant in front of this. If you, you could think of it like that. And so what we, we actually get is d mu phi. And then we're going to get um, these guys with this. So that's just going to be minus m phi, like that. And this here is our Dirac equation. This is a very important equation, and we're gonna see that this equation plays a huge role in particles of spin and so forth. Um, spin one half particles, if you will. And we'll get into that later. We now wanna talk about the solutions to the Dirac equation. Um, I'm looking at my time here and I'm wondering if I should have the solutions be in a separate video. So I think I'm gonna do that because even though I'm pushing on around 20 minutes now, I think it might take a little longer to flesh out the solutions to the Dirac equation. Before we leave though, I just wanna, I wanna emphasize, right? So the Dirac equation can be thought of as just like we've been seeing with the Klein-Gordon equation, I'll rewrite the Klein-Gordon equation. Right, so this is our Klein-Gordon equation. Um, or, yeah, our Klein-Gordon equation. And our Dirac equation is this one. It's this right here. Um, You see similar some similarities here, right? We have kinetic terms, right? We have these kinetic terms, and we have these potential terms. <clears throat> I'll write out this is Klein Gordon and this is Dirac. Um, again, Klein Gordon is for scalars, and Dirac is for spinners. There's different ways we can also derive the Dirac equation, and maybe I'll go through those in a separate playlist. This is just how we come to the Dirac equation in this book. Um, and so you can see the similarities. We, want, we also wanna keep in mind, just at the forefront of our heads, the bird's eye view video that I went through a while back. I think it was like the first video I made. What the, what fundamentally what these are, so we don't lose sight of the big picture. What these are is that they're fields, right? So we have, this is a field. It's a function of X, or it's a, it's a function of space-time. This is also a function of space-time. And this is a function of space-time. And this is a function of space-time. Um, 
right? So we can have complex scalars and we can have adjoint spinners. And what, so what have we been, what have we covered so far is we co we've covered um, the, the fields themselves, right? So we have scalar fields. So scalar fields and spinner fields. And the Lagrangians that sort of give way to their their dynamics, right? Their dynamics is governed by these equations here, right? So we had the Klein-Gordon equation, the Dirac equation. We had our Klein-Gordon Lagrangian and our Dirac Lagrangian, and that's really the the, the, the for, again for a bird's eye perspective so far is that we're saying. Um, we take a look at, um, we, we don't want to, we, we don't want to get lost in all the derivations here. That's my point. We don't want to get lost in all the derivations. We want to constantly keep on coming back to what is the big picture? Because I can guarantee as you go deeper and deeper into quantum field theory, you can very easily lose sight of what the big picture is. And so what I'm going to aim to do from here on out, because it gets really complicated, right? It, it gets, uh, we have to keep track of a lot of stuff. We have to keep track of spinners. We have to keep track of their adjoints. We have to keep track. Then we're going to have to keep track of um, what exactly is meant when we talk about uh, the indices on, on, on gauge fields. We want to always, I'm, I'm pressing this point here, we want to always come back to where the big picture is. What are the fundamental fields and what are their dynamics? And from there we can really just, the, those, those are where the derivations start, basically. Um, and so, I'm going to call it, at, I'm going to call it here and we're going to get into uh, the solutions to the Dirac um, equation in the next video. So I'll see you guys. Th thanks for watching. If you're, again, if you like this kind of content, please subscribe, visit my Patreon page, um, and I'll see you guys in the next one.